Today's video, we're gonna talk about a bunch of things that made full-time travel possible for me. So let's go. What is going on YouTube? Greetings from rural Missouri. I'm here at a state park. For those that don't know, I had COVID. Today is my first day out of quarantine and I figured what a better way to spend it than to go find a state park, especially one with a beautiful river like this and just hang out here all day. It's the beginning of March in Missouri. So most of the state parks are abandoned. So I've got this awesome park with this beautiful river almost completely to myself. So it's pretty cool. So I've been held up with COVID for a while. I was taking care of my mother with COVID for a little while. And then I got COVID and I'm just coming off quarantine. So I've been struggling to come up with video ideas. And the other day I was going through some of my old files and I ran across a PowerPoint presentation about being a digital nomad and being debt free, location arbitrage, and a bunch of other different topics I used to discuss a lot on this channel. I actually put that PowerPoint together about a year and a half ago. I was a guest speaker on Amber from Story Chasing's course on how to be a digital nomad. If you've never checked out Amber's channel, you should go check it out. So that's where this information actually came from. I get the question all the time, how do you afford the travel full time? So this will provide some of those answers. So let's go over to the van and we'll jump into this course. All right, so let's jump right into this. You'll see that this presentation is called The Digital Nomad and Debt Freedom. It's not just about debt freedom, but that's a major part of this. But there's some cool stuff that I'll talk about uh, towards the end of this brief as well. But a lot of it is debt related, but hopefully you get something out of it. That term digital nomad. So a lot of my audience is an RV van life audience, and you might not be familiar with this term, but there's a whole culture built around this lifestyle called being a digital nomad. And basically what a digital nomad is, it's someone who's still working, still has a job, but they've been able to figure out how to do that job remotely. I can show you examples of people from just about every career path you can think of that was able to convince their employer to let them do it digitally, but you don't have to be a digital nomad to take something away from this. Maybe you're on a fixed income, like social security, military retirement, something like that. You'll still be able to take something away from this presentation. If you've been watching my channel for a long time now, you know I'm a huge proponent of being debt free. I think it's the number one reason I've been able to live the life that I live live a full-time travel life. And I think it's the number one thing that prevents people from doing what they want to do in their life, no matter what it is, whether it's travel full-time, spend more time with their family, whatever it is. I think that debt is the thing that prevents people from doing that kind of stuff. All right, so let's jump into this. So in this little course, we'll talk about who I am, why debt-free, some debt-free methods, um, some debt-free tools, and then we'll talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is location arbitrage. And I'm really excited to introduce that to some of my van life RV watchers. That's really my favorite part of this course, to be honest with you. I just realized I forgot to mention the pictures in this course. And as I'm going through these slides, I'll talk a little bit about the picture I took. So I'm going to go back one slide. And this is probably the best picture I ever took that kind of, to me, embodies what is meant by the term digital nomad. This is my friend Eric, and we were at a town in Mexico called Porto Escondido. We were at a Salina, which is a really cool place to stay when you travel. Salinas are like a cross between a hotel, a hostel, a co-working space. They're just really cool. And this one in Porto Escondido is really, really cool. And I was there with my friend Eric, and he was really working by the pool that day. He works in real estate and he was doing it in Mexico by the pool. So that's where this picture came from. This picture is from a little town in Colombia. I believe it's called Guadape. And it's just like a picturesque town. It's really cool. All right, so like I mentioned, this was a presentation for a course for people that didn't know me. So I had a little slide about who I am. You can see it's a little bit dated. It says I'm 43 years old here, which is not the case. I'm 45, working on 46. I was born, in the, born and raised in the Midwest in St. Louis. At 19 years old, I joined the Navy. 
I did that for 20 years. I got to travel the world. It's where I fell in love with traveling. I retired. I went to law school. I was a juvenile defense attorney for a while. And then I was a corporate lawyer in New York City. And one day I was just sitting at my desk and all I wanted to do was travel. And I was watching travel videos on YouTube. And I said, why don't I just go and travel and try to turn it into a business? And so I quit my job. And in January of 2019, I left on a one year around the world adventure. And mid 2020, I bought this van and started traveling around the US. So I've been traveling for two full years now, full time. This picture is a picture of me in the Navy. I was a command master chief. At that time, I was the command master chief of an F-18 squadron. So um, I think that's the final official Navy photograph I took. And like it says at the bottom, I left my job to pursue my passion, which really is traveling. I, I just, I love traveling. All right, so why debt free? So to me, life is dictated by expenses. Expenses really decide how much flexibility you have. And so I've come up with two categories of expenses, and this is from a travel perspective. Those two categories are expenses you travel with and expenses you should ditch. And I'll explain that first one a little bit more in a moment. This picture right here is one of my favorite pictures. That's me. It almost looks like a fake background, but I guarantee you it is not. It is in Peru. It's near Cusco. Uh, I was on a hike to Rainbow Mountain. You'll see a picture of that in a moment. But this is me just looking out at the beautiful scenery. I had hair at that time and I'm wearing pants, which you'll rarely find me in. All right, so I just mentioned expenses you travel with. So what are those? The first one is a roof over your head. No matter whether you're a full-time traveler or you live in a stationary location, you probably need a roof over your head. It could be this van. This van is a roof over my head. It could be an Airbnb that you're paying for when you're staying down in Puerto Escondido. It can be an apartment you rent in Thailand for $150 a month. Whatever it is, you need a roof over your head. That's an expense you're going to have no matter what. The second one is food. Obviously, we need to eat. So that's an expense you're going to travel with no matter what. Next is transportation costs. Whether you're traveling around in a van like this, you have to pay for gas or you fly to your location, you have to pay for a plane ride. Although I know how to get around paying for plane rides. We'll talk about that in a little bit. If you're living in Bali, ridden a scooter so you can get around. If you're staying in a city with great public transportation, you still got to pay for that transportation if you want to jump on the subway. So that's really an expense you travel with. And last but not least, this one's kind of controversial. Some people say you don't have to have this one, but I think you should have health insurance. So that's the fourth expense I think that you travel with and you should have. So yeah, those are four expenses that you're going to have no matter what your situation. But I'm going to argue if you only have those four expenses, you can basically live whatever kind of life you want to live. All right. So this picture is another one of my favorites. It's with my friend JG, Joe, and Jill, my good friends from the program I did called Remote Year. We hiked in Patagonia. I believe this place is called Three Sisters because of the three um, rock formations. That was in Patagonia on the Chilean side. All right, so next are expenses I think you should ditch in order to live the life you want to live. Credit card debt, car loan debt, personal loans, mortgage debt, all debt. When you don't have debt, you have so much control over what you're able to do. I'm a huge believer in not having any kind of debt. I know that's kind of controversial, but that's what's worked for me. And when I talk to people about this lifestyle, usually the number one barrier is debt in all its forms. All right, so I love this picture. This is in front of Rainbow Mountain. I mentioned earlier that I was hiking in Peru. It's a pretty rough hike because I think you're at like 14,000, 15,000 feet. Actually, maybe a little higher than that. Um, I know it's just below Everest Base Camp, like the height of it. So I think it might be at like 16, 17,000 feet. So it's not an easy hike, but I mean, look at this view. It's like a gorgeous place. All right, so back to why debt-free. We talked about lifestyle is dictated by expenses. The biggest reason for this is the more expenses you have, the more income you need to generate. So if you have $2,000 worth of expenses, you need to generate $2,000 a month just to cover your expenses. And we'll talk more about this later when I talk about location arbitrage and how cheap you can live in some awesome places in the world with just a little bit of income. All right, this picture was taken the second time I went to Machu Picchu. It was a really cloudy day and I just thought this picture was really cool. All right, so lifestyle is dictated by expenses. The more expenses you have, the more income you need to generate. So if you reduce that debt, like I mentioned before, you have more financial freedom to live the lifestyle you wanna live. So this picture here is my first 
first picture from Machu Picchu. I did like a two or three day hike into Machu Picchu on the Incan Trail. And when you get to Machu Picchu, it's just amazing. I was exhausted in this picture. I don't know if you can tell, but it was just really cool to be there and see it. So what's the whole point of me talking about this? It's because the goal is to have your only expenses be the expenses you travel with. And then you have so much more flexibility to travel as much as you want. This picture here is another one of my favorites. It's from Cusco. I was having a cup of coffee early in the morning. There was hardly anybody out. And I just had this great view. I was sitting on this balcony, drinking my cappuccino and just feeling like so thankful that I get to live the life I live. All right, so I won't bore you too much, but I'll talk a little bit about the debt-free methods because people are always like, yeah, it sounds great, debt-free. How the heck do you do that, Kevin? So there are really two primary methods. Choose whatever one works for you. A lot of people will tell you one is better than the other. I'm kind of a Dave Ramsey disciple, so I use the debt snowball method, but use either one to get you to where you need to be, whichever one you feel comfortable with. So the benefits of the avalanche method is it's the one that makes the most sense mathematically. If you take emotion out of it and you just use the math, it'll get you debt free the quickest. So how do you do that? You line up your debts in order of interest rates and you pay off the highest rate first. Here's kind of an example of that. Your Visa card has a 16% interest rate, which is really common in the credit card industry, sometimes even higher than that. So of course you want to put that one first and then you start knocking that debt out and working your way down to the lowest interest rate. Like I mentioned, this one makes the most mathematical sense and it takes the least amount of time. But if you're like me, you're an emotional person, maybe you need a method that gives you some small victories early on. That's what I needed. So I used what's called the snowball method. So there's a certain psychology behind this and why people who use this method are more likely to pay off their debt, even though mathematically it doesn't make sense. It's because they get small victories early on, which keeps them motivated. With this one, you pay off the lowest balances first. You just ignore the interest rates and you work your way down. And so you'll start paying things off completely quicker. And that gives you kind of the illusion of accomplishing something. So here's an example. It's the exact same numbers as before except you're taking the smallest balance and you're putting it at top and you're working your way down. All right, so next up are some debt-free ideas and tools. I'm sure some of you are saying, look, I don't got two nickels to rub together. I can't even afford to pay down debt. So here's some ideas maybe that'll help you out. All right, number one is go in and ask your boss for a raise. All he or she can say is no, but maybe they say, yeah, and now you're bringing in a little bit more income and you take whatever that raise is and you toss it at your debt. Okay, the next thing are side hustles. All of us got things laying around the house. Like, I mean, I have things in this van that I could probably sell online. I mean, people love these Pendleton blankets. I could probably sell this Pendleton blanket for 20 bucks, you know? And then I could just cover myself up with this one. You can find things around your house that maybe you're not using. Go look in your closet, go on Facebook Marketplace, throw that on there, have a garage sale, whatever it is. You can raise some capital that way and start knocking out debt. The next one is an idea I got from my friend. She has a three bedroom house. And what she did to pay off her house was she started airbnb the other two rooms. She was in Florida, so her bedrooms were always full and she was making a ton of money, actually enough to where she quit her job. So if you can Airbnb out a room in your house, maybe look into that, that'll generate some extra income, sometimes a significant amount of income. And on that same note, since most of the people that watch my videos are RVers or have a van, a lot of you don't live in them full time, you have them sitting in your driveway. Well, you can rent those things out now. There are all kinds of services for doing that. So that's another way to generate some extra income. If you have a car, you live in a city or a town where people take Ubers, you can Uber drive. There's a website called Fiverr where you can sell your skills, whatever it is. Everyone's got some sort of skill they can sell. Like me, I can teach people how to make money on YouTube. There's an app called TaskRabbit and a bunch of other apps like TaskRabbit where people hire you to run errands for them, things like that. When I was traveling, I actually taught English online and actually made a pretty good income. I can make two to 3,000 a month um, teaching 30 hours, 40 hours a week. It's actually really easy to get into. You don't need any kind of teaching background. Some of the services require you to have a bachelor's degree, but there are others that don't. I think Dada doesn't require you to have a bachelor's degree. They just require that English is your native language. So those are some ways to increase your income and like speed up paying off that debt. All right, so this picture is from a Selena in Medellin, Colombia. I was at the co-working space and they had these cool little nets 
that you could just hang out on and work. And that's what I was doing here. I was probably editing a video or something. All right, next up is decreasing your expenses. So maybe you can increase your income and decrease your expenses. Now you have more money to pay off debt with. A lot of you have probably heard of David Bach. He talks about finding your latte factor. They did a study of people who live in cities and they spent like $5 a day on lattes. So that ended up being like $150 a month. So if you make your coffee at home and take that extra money and apply it to your debt, obviously you'll get your debt paid off faster. You just have to figure out what your latte factor is. We all have them. Like I drink a lot of Cherry Coke Zero. So if I quit drinking Cherry Coke Zero, I'd probably save a ton of money. This is one that I did, okay? So I told you I was a Dave Ramsey disciple. If you don't know who Dave Ramsey is, Google him. He wrote a book called Total Money Makeover. And in there he talks about, look, when you're trying to pay off your debt, you need to reduce your expenses. So just start eating rice and beans every meal. And that's what I did. I just come out of a divorce. I had a ton of debt and it was basically crushing me. And I didn't want to live like that anymore. So for about a year and a half, I ate really, really cheaply. I ate a lot of rice. I ate a lot of beans. I had a lot of things that were were really, really cheap to buy and really easy to make because you guys know I don't cook. Dave Ramsey has a saying that I love. It's live like no one else now, like living on rice and beans so you can live like no one else later. And that's how I kind of live now. I don't really care what my food costs. I just want to eat good food. And so I'll spend whatever I have to spend to eat good food because I'm in a position where I can do that now. But the only reason I can do that was because I ate rice and beans for a little while. All right, so next up is location arbitrage, which I'm going to talk more about. I love talking about this. So it's basically abandoning rent, abandoning a mortgage and living in an RV or living somewhere overseas where you can get a place to live really cheap. And we'll talk about that more in a second. This picture right here almost brings a tear to my eye. It was my second day of full-time travel. The night before I had arrived in Lima, Peru on an airplane. And the next morning I went out for a run. And this is a picture I took while I was on the run. There's these awesome cliffs in Lima, Peru that overlook the ocean. And I was running along those cliffs and I was just like so overcome with emotion that I was living this life, the life I always wanted to live. I was actually living it. I was doing what I wanted to do, which was travel. I was in a very exotic location or what I considered exotic, Lima, Peru. And I was running along these amazing famous cliffs that you see in other people's Instagrams. I was there. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite, favorite, favorite websites. It's called Nomad List. So it's a free website, although you can pay 99 bucks and get a lifetime membership. I'm not affiliated with them in any way, but I have a lifetime membership because I like the data I can get from them on different locations throughout the world. And if you're not a world traveler, this is a great place for you to start to find places and give you ideas of places to travel. All right, so location arbitrage. I love that phrase, location arbitrage. What it means is making your living with a strong currency, living in a place that has a weaker currency. We're gonna go over a few of these, but you can see in this first little graphic here, some different places. If you look down in the uh, lower right-hand corner, you'll see how much it costs to live there for a digital nomad or a nomad, someone that's living there for at least a month. A couple of my favorites are in this graphic right here, Budapest and Chiang Mai, Thailand. But let's start with Bali, cause that's like the hipster place everyone wants to go. I like Bali, but I'm not like a huge, huge fan of Bali. I actually like the island next to Bali called Lombok, but I figured we'll talk about Bali because this is where a lot of people want to go because they've seen Eat, Pray, Love. All right, so location arbitrage is all about living an awesome, luxurious lifestyle, but for a low cost. And Bali is one of those places you can do that. You can get a really nice one bedroom apartment for about $350 a month. I like studio apartments, which I know I'm kind of weird, but I just like everything in one room. I can get a nice studio near the beach for under $300 in Bali. So that's one of those expenses you travel with, a roof over your head at pretty low cost. Another one of those expenses you travel with is food. You can eat an amazing dinner on $3. You can live in a place like Bali on $1,500 a month, like a queen or a king. I know people that live in Bali on $500 a month and live a pretty good life. All right, so next up is Chiang Mai, Thailand. This is a digital nomad hotspot. It's one of my favorite. If you're looking for a place to start a digital nomad lifestyle, a full-time travel lifestyle, but you're kind of nervous. There's a huge expat community there, Americans, British, Australian, people from other countries, Germany, and they kind of congregate in Chiang Mai, Thailand. So 
when you go there, it'll feel comfortable. It'll feel Western. I've got a video of an apartment I stayed in in Thailand. If you go on Airbnb, you can actually pull that apartment up right now and stay there for somewhere around $300 a month. If you show up and don't book it on Airbnb, you just show up, you'll get it for a lot cheaper too. You'll see you can get a one bedroom for under $400. And a lot of people that go to Chiang Mai and are watching this video are gonna say, if you're paying $400 a month for an apartment in Chiang Mai, you're getting ripped off because a lot of people stay at apartments with pools with not a whole lot of amenities for about $115, $150 a month. But I personally like places with more amenities like a pool, things like that. So I usually spend a little bit more. I'll spend about $400, $450 a month for a studio in a really nice building that has a gym, a pool that's in the heart of town. And again, I mentioned you can eat really, really cheap cheaply when you live in places like this thailand is no exception it's actually cheaper to eat out than it is to actually buy stuff and make it and we're talking about amazing amazing food for pretty inexpensive so you can live in thailand for anywhere from 700 to around 13 1400 a month and live a really really good western style lifestyle all right next up is somewhere in europe so i have a video about budapest i love budapest you can stay there for pretty cheap as well you can find a one bedroom for about 500 a month if you're a studio dweller like me about 400 a month in the best part of the city where all the hot spots are all the restaurants um, it's a really cool city i always tell people budapest is like being in paris but at like a fourth of the price and Hungarians are actually nice people where Parisians are a little bit snooty sometimes. You can do a city like Budapest on about $1,100 to $1,500 a month and live pretty comfortably. This is another one of my favorites. It's called Bengsko, Bulgaria. If you watch Johnny FD's channel, he's the one that kind of made this place famous in the digital nomad community. So Bengsko, Bulgaria is actually a pretty famous ski resort. But in the summer, obviously skiers aren't coming there and they figured out they could rent out their ski chalet apartments to digital nomads and there's so many of them they're super cheap so you can live in the mountains in this ski resort town during the summer for very very little money i had an airbnb there and it was 270 dollars and i got that on airbnb had i went to bangsko bulgaria and negotiated i could have got it for much cheaper you'll see by this graphic the average one bedroom is 230 dollars a month that is crazy crazy cheap think about that but if you want to stay in a hotel, you want your sheets changed every day, you can stay in a European hotel in a ski resort town for under $600 a month. A dinner will cost you about five bucks. I put Coke in there because I think you can really judge a place by how much a Coke is. Like you saw Bali, I think a Coke is like 36 cents for a Coke. Here in Bulgaria, it's 86 cents, so it's a little bit more expensive. But I think Coke is a good a good gauge. You can live in Bulgaria, in Bengsko, Bulgaria, for actually cheaper than you can live in Thailand, which kind of blows my mind. All right, last up is Medellin, Colombia. We're jumping over to South America. I tried to give you a sample of a bunch of different places, some in Asia, some in Europe, and now we're jumping over to South America. There are tons of places like Medellin. This is just one of my favorites. Again, you can live very, very affordably in Medellin. For under $500 a month, you can get a one bedroom. If you dwell in studios like I do, knock $100 off that. Dinner will run you under $5. If you're in Medellin, go to a place called Betty's Bowls and you'll have the best bowls of goodness they have a bunch of different styles of bowls you know like the uh, as acai bowls or whatever they call them acai bowls things like that but other kind of bowls as well you'll thank me when you go there and it's so cheap a coke is under 50 cents and because cost of living is so low there once you get past lodging you can live really comfortable there for under a thousand dollars easily 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 all right, so next up, this is all about full-time travel, right? So here's a little like location arbitrage schedule. You can spend your winters in Asia. You can bounce around from Thailand to Bali to Malaysia to Vietnam, living very inexpensively. If you don't know, once you get over to Asia, you can hop around on flights for about 15 to $20. So you spend your winters in Asia, you spend your summers in Europe, places like Bengsko, Bulgaria, uh, Prague, Czechoslovakia, the Canary Islands, Lisbon, Portugal, one of my favorite places. These are all places that I'm mentioning that you can live very affordably. If you look at Nomad List, you'll see what the costs are. And then when you're bored with Asia and Europe, just go down to South America, stay in Lima, Peru, Costa Rica, Medellin, Colombia, which I talked about, Mexico City, which is one of my favorite spots. 
There's so many options down in South America that are really affordable. And then you can hop over to the Middle East and stay in some really cool ancient cities. Like one of my favorites, Antalya, Muscat. There, there are tons over in the Middle East that are safe and very affordable. I almost never ever pay for a flight. I use what's called the Chase Trifecta. You can Google that. You don't have to watch my video on it. You can watch somebody else's video. Um, there's a guy named Ask Sebi that actually explains it much better than I do. I recommend that you subscribe to his channel. I don't know him at all, but he has good advice on how to kind of hack the credit card point system, especially for travelers. This picture right here is me and Amber from Story Chasing right before I embarked on my one year around the world trip. She did an interview with me. It was really cool. I met her in Arizona. Amber is just an awesome person. Make sure you subscribe to her channel, which is called Story Chasing. All right, so I won't go too much into this slide, but once you're debt free, your question is probably like, okay, now how do I earn income on the road living this full-time travel dream? The first and most reliable way is to convince your employer to let you work remotely. So if you have a job that lends itself to that, and maybe you've been doing it remotely in COVID, try to convince your employer to let you continue working remotely. Say, hey, look, this has worked. If that doesn't work, find a remote job. I mentioned teaching English online. Almost anybody can do that. And earn somewhere between 1500 to 3000 a month. It's a pretty simple process. And once you get started, that's a reliable way to make income on the road. And then just start looking for other things. I have a lot of friends that had jobs that they just couldn't do remotely. So they taught their self computer programming. There are a bunch of different computer programming languages that you can learn. You don't need to go to college for it. You can be self-taught. My friend Remote Darren did that. There are tons of people that do that. But even if those things are not your thing, Google remote work and you'll probably find something that you're interested in. You can also turn your side hustles into your full-time gig. Like I did, I turned my YouTube channel side hustle into a full-time income that supports my travel lifestyle. And the last is you can increase your passive income. If you have a house that you paid off, you can rent it out and you've got some passive income. You can, you know, get dividend producing stocks. You can rent out your RV while you travel overseas. There's a bunch of different ways you can increase passive income. All right, this picture right here is right when we started hiking towards Machu Picchu. We just took a group photo. Pretty cool shot of all my buddies. I traveled full time with all of these people for a year. When I did this course, I was traveling with a remote year, so I wanted to explain this program to people because I always get questions about it. So basically what remote year is, it's a company that handles the logistics of travel for you. You pay a monthly fee. In my case, it was $2,000 a month. Yes, you can travel much cheaper than that, but I was just starting out and I wanted somebody to handle the logistics of travel for me. You travel for a year, you go 12 countries in 12 months, they have smaller programs now. They have a six month, I think, a four month and a one month program. The money you pay includes all your flights, your lodging, your co-working space, some activities and a bunch of lifelong friends. The people I travel with on remote year, I'm still friends with. We still travel together. You've seen some of my RV videos where I've been mooch docking. Those are remote year people mostly that I've been mooch docking at the places they were staying at, like in Tahoe, Breckenridge, Colorado, places like that. This picture was also in Peru. It was after an amazing day of hiking. We were all kind of exhausted. So here's where I open it up for questions. If you've got any questions, obviously you can't ask them live. So make sure you type them down below and I'll be sure to answer them. This picture is from Patagonia. I mean, if you've never been to Patagonia, you should put it on your list. Words can't describe how amazing it is. It's like real life Narnia. Like that, look at that picture there. It's just ridiculously gorgeous. The colors are amazing. All right, so if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit that thumbs up button. And if you like content like this, travel content, make sure you hit that subscribe button. I'll be back on the road in the van soon. I can't wait. Should be pretty awesome. Thank you for watching.